Alrighty, good afternoon. My name is Mary Petropolis. Thank you so much for joining us today for the next in our Deep Roots virtual series on native gardening. Deep Roots has been presenting these live sessions since early April and the beginning of the stay at home orders. Please continue to look for our live sessions every Tuesday at 4 p.m. going forward. Thank you all for tuning in. We greatly appreciate your continued support. If you've missed any of this series so far, you can find our previous sessions recorded at deeprootskc.org slash webinars. When you're outside this week, don't forget to enter our giveaway contest for which we've partnered with Boulevard Brewing Company. We will select our last two winners this coming Friday. Take a photo of yourself with your favorite native plant and post it with the hashtag native plant fling. Tag Deep Roots KC and fling cocktails for your chance to win a prize pack of fling cocktails and some beautifully illustrated native plant note cards designed by local artist Nancy Waugh. We've chosen four winners so far and still have many prizes to give away. Good luck. We are thrilled to announce that we will still be holding our Planet Native Conference this year, virtually. Please stay tuned as we upside our, update our website to reflect these changes. We hope to see many of you there. The conference will be held from September 16th through 18th. Today's webinar features April Anderson of Naturally Good Interpretation. April is both incredibly passionate and knowledgeable about native container gardening, and it's based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Container gardens can be a great way to incorporate natives into your yard if you live in an apartment or don't have a lot of space. So please join me in welcoming April. All right, very good. This is a picture that was taken outside of a church I attend. And, and I wanted to show you uh, that natives, when, when people think of natives in containers, sometimes they think of, you know, just natives or just ornamentals. But what I want you to think about is the flowers you like. And, uh, at this, with this particular congregation, we have some people that need things to look really good right now. And, you know, it's the first thing people see uh, before they walk through the door of the edifice. And so what was really important was to have something look good that everybody was happy with. Because when you're working with a group of people, you need to have a certain look, uh, you know, that they're expecting. So uh, we have pansies uh, right here. Uh, I'm going to use a little pointer. Uh, these are these are garden flocks and creeping jenny. So we'll talk a little bit more about the types of plants we put in planters and how natives can fulfill those those needs. Okay, so quick overview here. Uh, we have th this is basically our presentation today. A little background, some planning care. Uh, what happens? after the container, uh, a little bit of wrap up and a whole bunch of resources. So I'm glad you're here and um, I look forward to working with you on ideas with regard to your containers. So a little bit of background. I realize that some of you have extensive gardening experience as well as uh, others that, that may not have that, that same type of experience. So I'm just gonna try to you know, zip through it quickly for those of you who know these things and for those who may not think of it in terms of a container, just to kind of introduce the concepts. So background wise, you know, look, at, look at where you're having the container. Uh, what's your light situation like? Um, is it, you know, is it that, that dappled light because it's going to be maybe underneath some trees? Is it going to be um, really heavy duty late afternoon western exposure where it just gets baked? Uh, is it more eastern light? Is it, uh, you know, what, what's it like where you're putting this container? Uh, we'll also explore a little bit more about soil uh, and, and soilless mixes. It kind, of, kind of sounds like an oxymoron, right? Soilless mixes, we're putting plants in it, but it'll make sense. And uh, container, uh, what, what can you use for a container? Uh, I do quite a bit of work at the National Museum of Transportation here in St. Louis, and we have some really interesting containers. I think you'll enjoy it. And then looking at some of the plants. Uh, there are so many plant combinations. As I said, you don't have to be a purist. If you wanted to add some, some herbs to it because you like herbs, go for it. 
So getting into light, uh, this, this just shows, you know, how we can define lighting requirements. So, you know, typically full sun is, is six or more hours of light. Okay, exception to be, would be if it's Western and it's just getting baked in the late afternoon, then I try, I, I tend to put native plants that are full sun in those types of areas, even though they're not getting, you know, maybe six hours because the intensity of the light, I tend to put, you know, plants that can take more sunlight, like a full, like a, a native that's labeled full sun in that situation. Okay, and that, that's, you know, when it says under part sun, dappled or flaming, you know, part sun means it's getting some sun. Uh, it's, it's not in full shade, it's not in full sun. Uh, and full shade is less than three hours. Uh, when I say, you know, and I, I talked about flaming, that's the Western light. Uh, if you stand next to a, a building that's facing, you know, with that Western side, you know what I'm saying when, it's, when I say it's, it's flaming hot. And, you know, that, that's an important thing to consider with light. And so right here we have, and actually ours are blooming right now at the museum, uh, prickly pear right plant, right place. And uh, it's, it's definitely a consideration. You can eat the fruit, you can eat the, the plants itself. Uh, it's really delicious actually, gotta get the spines off. But, um, but that is you know, one plant for a container and you can see it right here. Uh, I actually have a volunteer I work with at the museum who's just enamored by this plant. <laughs> She's always wanting to plant more of it. Uh, because, you know, it is such an amazing plant. And as you can see in this particular, uh, this, this particular picture, it's on a terrace. Uh, you know, it, it looks like it kind of has a darker pot. Um, it may not be the right plant if you have little people around uh, that could potentially hurt themselves or pets. Again, it's just something to be aware of as you're deciding what to put in your container plantings. Okay, this brings us to a discussion of soil. And when we look at soil, you know, soil is, is another way of nourishing your plant. A soilless mix can have all kinds of different things in it. Uh, you can buy mixes at, at the hardware store. Uh, you know, you can make your own mix. Uh, you can combine, uh, as I said here, um, coconut core or peat uh, that will contain, that will help to hold some moisture. Perlite or vermiculite, uh, which will help to, you know, encourage drainage and as well as sand so you know if, if you're handy and you like to mix things you can mix stuff if you want to go and get something that actually says a potting mix you can get that the the challenge that you have in a pot is pots can either hold water or they can drain water and it can get super dry and so that's where, and the compo compost is what you're going to feed it. You don't have to use fertilizers or, or special chemicals. These are native plants, so they're already adapted to all kinds of amazing conditions. Uh, but drainage is key, as I say, because of the fact that you don't want, unless, unless it's, you know, a plant is accustomed to standing water, uh, it can potentially rot. So you wanna try to avoid that. And so this gives us a, a look at some containers. And uh, this is actually right here on the left, we're looking at uh, a tow truck. And what we did was, uh, this is all lined with weed fabric. What you don't see is underneath, uh, and underneath is the the air goes around it, which can be good and bad, okay, because it can cool it off, but at the same time, in the winter time, we're talking cold weather, and that cold weather can have an impact on the root system of these plants. So what we have in here, I point some things out. Oh, there's our pointer again. Uh, these are milkweed plants. 
they were really slow to get up this year. And I thought, oh my goodness, I, I don't know if we, if we lost them or not, but we didn't. Although now that it has been dry, uh, it's a challenge because, and you probably noticed there's rocks here. Let me point those, at, well, I don't have to point those out, you can see the rocks. So these rocks, what we do is we, it's basically a, like a big hump of soil right here. And the rocks are check dams. So when it rains, if we didn't have those rocks there, because this was a picture taken right after the installation, there wouldn't be really extensive root systems to hold these soils in place. And I should have taken a picture today because if we look at today, what's actually in the back of this truck, let me find my pointer again. I keep losing it in there. Uh-oh. Um, here, get our pointer. Uh, right at the base, where the rocks kind of hit that, uh, that metal piece in the back, we have a whole bunch of little tiny sprouts. And those little tiny sprouts are, where you have the sphinx moth, oop, keep going back, sorry about that. Um, the middle picture, which has the sphinx moth, the little tiny sprouts are the native Cleome. And Cleome is a favorite of sphinx moth, as well as lots of other, uh, other great pollinators. So uh, you probably see a vine on the right. I keep trying to do the, the little arrow, but it's not letting me do it. So vine on the right is actually a trumpet creeper. So the idea was that we wanted something that would kind of crawl up the truck and kind of cover it a little bit. Uh, plants in the middle, those uh, leafy tall green plants are aromatic aster. And uh, to the left, that other vine that you're looking at is supplejack. So vines going up, the, uh, the asters, which eventually filled in the back of that, that truck bed, there are only three of them, but they just, you know, burst it out and just, you know, and then they, we have a whole bunch of little aster babies in the back along with the Cleome. So that's one container. <laughs> A more conventional container to the right are just basically pots and you don't have to have everything the same size or the same color. Uh, I would say you might want to veer toward lighter colors because it, get, it does get really hot in the summertime and you have to think about how that's going to impact your plants. And then we'll look at double potting here as well. So in the uh, the church planner that I initially showed you right here. Uh, oh, sorry. In that planner, we basically took the pansies, we moved them out. Uh, we had a donation of mums at one point. Mums don't last very long. Uh, these were not the perennial mums. And, and so, <laughs> we had people that were like, oh, we really want mums. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, the garden phlox is is a perennial, which we eventually dug out, moved, and, and put another place at the end of the season. But the mums went along with the garden phlox at one point, and we left them in the containers and buried them, kind of like the photo underneath, where you can kind of see the person that's just putting the plastic pot in a another pot, a decorative pot where you can't see it. Except we took the plastic pot and buried it in the soil so that we could just pop it out and be done with it. Uh, is that a good idea with native plants? The native plant's gonna grow. It is gonna develop a root system. Now, if it's a very tiny plant and you're just trying to keep track of it and not have it wash away, it can actually be pretty good. So double potting is also used on the right. You see the ammo boxes that are hanging there. I'll show you right there. Uh, this is done, this is basically an herb garden, not a native garden. But again, if you're working with a very tiny plant, like a seedling, I would say double potting is a really good idea because then the water's not going out and getting lost in the container. Because you can see the container, uh, at the church is huge. So when you water that, uh, you're, it basically takes a gallon and, and it's probably begging for more <laughs> after that uh, because 
all the water is going around and not necessarily exactly where you want it to go. Whereas if you've got a pot, it'll go in that area. The flip side of that is you can also have plants that are pot bound and then, then you're, you've got you know, roots dying off because it becomes too dry. So it's just kind of a matter of managing what you have and just being really conscious of it. So I, I call, this, uh, call this part color because I've got uh, some rose verbena, but then I also have, and it's early in the season, so you have to forgive this picture, um, another picture of, um, of basically an unconventional container. So the rose verbena is in a couple tires, the bottom tire is, is completely full of rock because we didn't have a budget to buy a ton of soil. Okay, we just didn't. And so what we did was we filled it to rock all the way so that the there's, as I said, two tires. The bottom tire is full of rock. The rock goes all the way up here. So the second tire is about halfway full of rocks. And then we went to went to a finer grade gravel. And then finally we get to the soil because Okay, we're not for profit. We have to be. We have to be really careful with our funds. Now, this rose verbena came back from last year. Uh, last year we had a few plants, and as you can see, it's just kind of opening up and filling this area. So, for those of you who've done con container gardening before, you have three types of plants. You have thrillers, fillers, and spillers. Um, a thriller is the oh wow, huge big plant. Uh, you know, like like the center, like the the one that you just focus your attention on. The the filler is the one that kind of goes around that and kind of kind of fills in the spaces. And the spiller is the one that goes over the side, kind of like a vine, like the creeping Jenny in the previous slide. Uh, and and when we're looking at rose verbena, it, it's not really a thriller, okay? But it is um, it is a filler for sure, and a little bit of a spiller. Okay, now to your right, what we're looking at here, these big bushy things. I wish you could be here in the fall and check this out, it's so beautiful. Uh, I just gave them a haircut. Uh, the, the bushy looking things on either end are aromatic aster. Let's see if I can point to them or not. In the middle, we have columbine right here. So a couple columbine. And then in, in the center of that, we have some Coreopsis. So when we're planning, when we're planning things, we try to plan for three different seasons. Okay, so Columbine came up. Actually, <laughs> this one looks really, really tiny um, because we were having something digging up our garden this past spring. So usually it would be bigger. It'd be a really nice dome of leaves and these beautiful red flowers because it's the native Columbine. Now we're holding out for Coreopsis for the summer. I am expecting good things. We actually had a lot more Coreopsis. I was kind of weeding it out and putting it in other areas today. And then at the ends, we've got that, that bang and, and filler of the aromatic aster. So uh, behind that, you're probably going, but there's liriope back there. Yep, there is. And I have not bothered to mess with it. Originally, right, oh, if I can point to it. Sorry, my pointer seems to be a little on and off. Um, in the middle of that, there was a tree. Well, you can imagine that tree got cooked. It had no place for its roots to go. Uh, you can see it's, it's very shallow as far as the depth of this container. And, and so consequently, this isn't a real good place to grow, uh, but it, it is a workable place for native plants. Uh, maybe not ones with taproots so much, but mo with more fibrous root systems. As well, and I'm still, I, you know, my, my, I'm just still experimenting a little bit with milkweed just to see because I've heard different things about milkweed and taproots and, so hopefully we figure that out with the back of the truck. Okay, so a little bit about plants. I talked about the, the three different kinds of plants. Um, and here's just some examples for you to think about. So thrillers, uh, you know, something that really show, shows well. 
one one challenge of thrillers is that they kind of don't bloom long enough <laughs> in my opinion they bloom and they're done and you know so I, I'm, I'm more of a fan of the fillers honestly uh, the Cleome is just a, a beast. Uh, it, it is aggressive. Okay, so some of these, like putting them in a container, can actually be really good, especially if you can lop off the flowers before they go to seed, it's, if you don't want them to, <laughs> to populate the world. Um, same thing with river oats. Very, very aggressive. Um, and, and then there's there's sedums that are considered native. I feel like I haven't seen them actually grow out in the wild, but they're considered native and they're, they're just great, especially with all the heat and dry um, conditions. So, so that's great. This particular year, the purple poppy mallow has been a beast. It's been amazing to watch. I don't think I've ever seen it grow this well. And that's the spiller. So that one, it can just actually kind of careen down the side of your container. Um, Missouri Primrose is good. All the half the time it looks like a weed and sometimes I find myself wanting to pull it out of the ground. I have to correct myself because it's just, it's just me. Maybe you see something else, but you know, uh, it's just something where you have to find a happy median for, for what works for you. And those are, those are full sun that we're talking about. Uh, I also love the, the Missouri coneflower because it has a smaller flower, but even now it's just got all this bushy green foliage and it's just, it's just a great plant. Uh, if you have something like the pale purple coneflower, you've got a food source for birds. I didn't, you know, what I did not include under fillers. I just remembered that was uh, the, the lance leaf coreopsis or the thread leaf coreopsis um, because and those are great fillers and they're also great uh, for feeding birds because of the fact that they've got such a great seed source. Okay, so that's full sun, baking. It's just brutal out there, but they're looking good with all this. And then you have part sun. So these plants need just a little more protection. They don't, they're, they're, not, they're not into that full sun scene. So, uh, although columbine, yeah, it can go back and forth a little bit. So wild geranium, columbine, both have these beautiful dome type uh, presentations. Goat's beard, it's just, you got to look this one up if you, don't have, if you haven't seen it already. Um, Aruncus is just beautiful um, because it's just kind of a different, different look to it. Um, I mean, just kind of think of a white plume sticking up. Uh, and then fillers, uh, heuchera is probably one of my favorite, uh, coral bells. And, and actually I had that in the church planting and got so many comments on it, not because of the flowers, just because it had cool foliage. And so, you know, foliage, I know you don't think about a planter having foliage, but if you can have something that's in there that you don't really have to spend a lot of time taking care of and it still looks good, you know, throughout the season, that's, that's a good thing. Um, Miss flower, again, you know, these little purple, little purple fuzzies. I mean, ground leaf, uh, round leaf ground cell, uh, the, the Packera obovata is just, you know, it's just great because it's like this pop of color. And then once it's gone, you've got some great, great leaves left behind wild ginger hearts you know and so it's so it's like what's not to love it's so wonderful now should i treat it like a native plant or a potted plant it's in a pot but it's still a native hmm well the answer is yes <laughs> you should you should keep an eye on it uh, you should realize that you may need to rotate out through the season it may not be it may not have the staying power. Now I'm going to make an exception to that because that rose verbena that you're seeing with the rosemary on the right hand side is going to, it, it, it likely will bloom more than once. So you see in that picture, it looks really nice. It'll, it'll look nice. It just will. Uh, usually it blooms spring and then later in the summer as well. Columbine, once it's done blooming, it'll go to seed. You can get the seeds, but 
it's not going to do anything over the summer. It's time is spring. So each native plant, be aware of its bloom time. Try to combine it with other things, either native or perennial that, that you like. Because it's in a container, you, can, you have that, that option of being able to do that. If it were not in a container, if it were in your yard and you were next to um, a very pristine natural area, you may not want to do that. But this is your yard, so it's a container. And, and you can also then share it with someone when you're, when you're done enjoying it. And that brings us to the afterlife. Okay, what do you do at the end of the season? I know we can't even think about that right now because we're right up, you know, we're just launching into the, 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 the thick of the gardening season. Well, A, you can put them in your garden uh, if you have a garden. Now, if you live in a townhome or, or condo or, or apartment and you don't have a garden, that's not really an option. Uh, you can share them with your friends you can or, or you know get your family involved in natives as well what we did at the museum when you saw that tow truck earlier is we actually left it in the tow truck i was a little nervous because you know well, it's an investment in plants you know we're putting money into this and i didn't know how it was going to work out it worked out uh, and and i was nervous because as i said there's nothing underneath the back of that truck to insulate it and so you've got cold air coming all the way around underneath where the where the roots would normally be in touch with the ground they're not and so you know i was i was very happy this plant survived i think it's really hard on plants and i don't know how long you can actually have plants in a container that's not in touch with the ground. Like let's say you had a hanging basket. I would probably put it in some type of container that could have you know, contact with the ground um, just because I, I think it's brutal. I think it's really hard on the plants. You know, it dries them out and you know, there's just potential freezing because what we're doing is we're creating an unnatural situation for these plants to live. Okay, we got a quick wrap up. Um, what I didn't mention about containers is they tend to be dry. They do, unless they're sitting under a downspout. So, so think dry, keep your soil light. That's why you mix in other ingredients and amendments. Um, don't be afraid to change out and have different plants. You don't need to have the same plants the entire season. I know it's ideal, everybody likes to do that. Don't feel like you have to overstuff. You might have one plant or you might have one plant in it. It might be okay to do that, uh, especially if it's a plant that's really full. Now, if it's a, you know, if it's multiple, you know, little plugs and it's going to take time for them to grow, you might want to keep them in those containers until they, they fill out the container and then put them in, you know, so that you've got the ability to then, you know, move them later. Uh, so mix it up. You don't have to just do natives together, okay? You can do natives with herbs. You can do, you know, just all kinds of mixes. Uh, embrace color and texture, be creative and have fun. So boom. Uh, but let me show you, these are resources. You're welcome to contact me. Uh, Missouri Botanic Garden has an awesome, uh, they're just awesome reservoir of information. And so there's a couple of uh, things for them. And Wild Ones, they actually have a newsletter online where they talked about their experience with different native plants. Now, this was for Wild Ones based in, um, in Wisconsin. So results can vary. But some of the ideas, some of the plants are, are the same as we have here. And we just have to be conscious of, of you know, how they move and, and react. Awesome. April, thank you so much for the great presentation. I've got a few questions for you if you'd like to answer some. All right, let's go for it. Alrighty. Um, Ken asks, my problem in adding compost is that I plant a plant to the specified depth. If I add compost, it will be above the soil line. What do I do? I would just kind of, you know what, when he, when, when you plant that plant, I would go ahead and just sprinkle the compost um, 
in the hole. <laughs> like just you know, put a handful of compost in the hole, put the plant on top of that. Alrighty, next one. Are there any good natives that you'd recommend for shallow containers? Right now I'm in love with the poppy mallow. <laughs> it's just a great, oh, it's so beautiful. And it's and it just it just spills over um, golden ground. So I mean, I guess there's a lot of them that you could put in a container that that don't I mean they yeah, root wise I see the I see the concern. Um, Cleome, the the native Cleome uh, just really prospers wherever it goes and is a great pollinator plant. I was, that kind of brings a really good segue into the next question. A lot of people are asking about the Cleome. What's the, what's the genus species um, which are you referring to as native? Oh, I need to look that up too. I know, um, I'm gonna have to, let me look that one up and get back to you because I knew it and then I'm, <laughs> I can't remember off the top <laughs> of my okay. head. Sorry. That's alrighty. Um, Ken asks, what do the asterisks mean on your list of plants? Oh, let me think here. I don't remember. <laughs> let me look here. Sorry, we'll flip back through. Asterixes. You got one like under the sun fillers. Yeah, I see that. Fillers. I see. I see my asterixes. Those are plants I've worked with quite a bit, and I really like them a lot. <laughs> I, Which is your favorites? I'm to there's something else I can tell you about those plants, except I really, yeah, those are, yeah, those are some of my favorites. Awesome. Um, uh, I this Val asks, I have been unsuccessful with a southern exposure on a deck or on hot pavement. My thought is that the soil is getting too hot. Do you have any thoughts? It could be, yeah, it could, it could definitely be a heat issue. Um, and it's southern exposure. Yeah, southern and western exposure are very difficult. I would say try a lighter color planter. Um, and, and try some plants that really love heat, <laughs> then, you know, um, if you, if you can try the, you know, your, you know, the sedums, those work extremely well. Um, also the prickly pear, which, you know, part of me goes, I should recommend and part of me goes, no, I shouldn't because <laughs> it's prickly and it's, it's an issue for some people. Um. Maria asks, what is the best choice to start a container garden with, a seed or small plants? I know you did the seed workshop a few weeks ago. So, you know, you could you go back and review that and, and kind of make a choice for yourself. Um, I would say you could do both, actually. You could seed some stuff in uh, and then you could also have some plants. And then even keep the plant, you know, if it's a tiny plant, keep it in the container. And then once it, it's growing out of the container, or once it's, you know, to a size where it's root bound, then you can take it out and put it into the larger container. Gotcha. And then we'll go ahead and do one more. The natives have deep roots. So how and why do they do well in a container? Well, it also depends on the container. How and why, um, so. They do have deep roots, and there are those like a. It was interesting because I was, I'm, well, I'm experimenting with one, and I don't know how it's going to turn out yet. <laughs> you know, when you look at the sylphiums in particular, uh, you look at compass plant, you look at prairie dock, you look at at, at these these incredibly, you know, thick, deep tap roots and going down, and those might be a challenge. Uh, you know, they might work to a point. Uh, at some point, you might need to get them out. And also, it might depend on the container, because I've seen those really large jardiniers, but then I've also seen smaller containers where I go, and eh, it doesn't have enough, there's not enough space for it to really go beyond, you know, the gallon size. So it's, it's just a matter of 
you know, getting to know the plant. And, and so, you know, the, the, the plants with the more fibrous roots, I think are really good choices for containers. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, April, and thank you to everyone at home for joining us. If you have any questions that we didn't get to today, please feel free to reach out to us with those at hello at deeprootskc.org. As we finish today, please head over to our website at deeprootskc.org, where we can help you find plants, plant a garden, locate helpful resources, and more. You can also watch the recordings of our previous webinars if you've missed something. If you're enjoying this series, we'd sincerely appreciate your support in the form of a donation. You can do that on our website as well. Don't forget to mark your calendars for the virtual edition of our Planet Native Landscapes Conference in September, with more details to come on our website soon. Next week, we will continue the series with a presentation about replacing your lawn with sedges. The presentation is with R Roberta Vogel-Litnug. I have seen Roberta's lawn myself, and it is remarkable, so be sure to tune in next Tuesday, June 16th at 4 p.m. Central. Thank you so much for joining us and stay safe out there. Thank you, April. Thank you.